Recording in progress. Good evening and welcome to the May 25th, 2021 meeting of the Cambridge Planning Board. My name is Catherine Preston Connolly and I am the chair. This meeting is being held remotely due to statewide emergency orders limiting the size of public gatherings in response to COVID-19 and in accordance with Governor Charlie Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, temporarily amending certain requirements of the open meeting law, as well as the City of Cambridge public meetings, city events, and city permitted events due to COVID-19 amended on October 26, 2020. This meeting is being video and audio recorded and is being streamed live over Zoom webinar. Please note that this meeting is not being broadcast on cable television. There will be a transcript of the proceedings. All board members, applicants, and members of the public will state their name before speaking. All votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public will be kept on mute until it is time for public comment. I will give instructions for public comment at that time, and you can also find instructions on the city's webpage for remote planning board meetings. I'll start by asking staff to take board member attendance and verify that all members are audible. Thank you, Catherine. This is Jeff Roberts from Community Development. Louis Bocci, are you present with the meeting audible to you? Present and audible. Thank you, Lou. H. Theodore, are you present and is the meeting audible to you? Present and audible. Thank you, Ted. Stephen Cohen, are you present and is the meeting audible to you? Say absent. Mary Flynn, are you present and is the meeting audible to you? Present and audible. Thank you, Mary. Hugh Russell, are you present and is the meeting audible to you? Present and audible. Thank you, Hugh. Tom Sinevich, are you present and is the meeting audible to you? I am present and the meeting is audible to me. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, associate members are not present. Kevin Preston Connolly, are you present and is the meeting audible to you? I am present and it is audible to me. Thank you, Catherine. That is six planning board members present. All right. Thank you very much. Um, all right, the first item is an update from Community Development Department. Please also introduce staff present at the meeting. Thank you, Chair Connolly. Uh, Eran Farouk, Assistant City Manager for Community Development. Um, starting with staff introduction, I'll start with our, our visitors. We have people from different departments. So um, joining us is Kathy Watkins, the City Engineer from the Department of Public Works. Sam Corda, who is the executive director of the city's water department. Uh, and from the CDD team, we have Suzanne Rasmussen, our director of environment and transportation planning, Colleen Mogasabi, a de deputy director, Eric Berkelson, from uh, urban designer from our community planning division, 
And from our Zoning and Development Division, we have Jeff Roberts, Director of Zoning and Development, and from his team, Swathi Joseph and Daniel Nestle. Um, and with that, I'm going to go to um, our agenda for today and upcoming meetings. So today is exciting because it's the very first time we're doing uh, an annual utility report at the board. Um, this, as you might recall, came about um, in response to a city, city council order from about two years ago uh, where the council requested that there be some mechanism for the city, particularly from a planning perspective, to understand um, how the utilities are um, structured in the city to be able to support development. And, and that's the reason why this is happening at the planning board. Um, I don't believe that there's any action required from the board, but it's, it's more of a time to have um, a, um, a presentation from, uh, from utilities as uh, in similar to the vein of um, the town gown reporting. And then of course the, the board uh, has the ability to uh, ask questions and frame any additional questions for future years um, annual reports as well. Um, next week, we do not have a, um, a planning board meeting, which is extremely exciting. Um, June 8th, is our next meeting, which will include two public hearings, um, 600, 625 Main Street, which is the Reagan Institute uh, continued hearing uh, for their special permit, and then zoning um, session hearing for Article 22 amendments, which um, I think we may, I'm going to uh, let Jeff speak to this afterwards. We may. Uh, be rescheduling that because the petition has been refiled. I am uh, a little bit uncertain as to where, whether that is happening or not. I apologize. Uh, and then uh, June 15th, we have a um, public hearing on 727 Mass Ave a special permit case, which is also a continued hearing. Um, and uh, of interest at City Council, this has been a very busy um, couple of weeks. Uh, we wrapped up budget hearings last week, and so this week and the next, uh, there are a lot of uh, council hearings of interest. Um, earlier today, the Council's Health and Environment Committee held a uh, public hearing on the Net Zero Action Plan five-year review process. Um, this is something that the board is quite familiar with from its uh, 2015 iteration, and now um, Tom is part of the, uh, the that task force uh, as well. And then uh, also talking to them about one of the major recommendations, um, which are amendments that are proposed to the city's building energy use disclosure ordinance that impacts um, energy use and emissions from existing buildings in Cambridge. Um, tomorrow, uh, the 26th, the Neighborhood and Long-Term Planning Committee of the City Council is going to have a discussion on uh, Harvard Square, particularly focused on uh, piloting street closures. Uh, and we are currently working on uh, Palmer Street, which, as you know, is uh, sort of shared street. It's mostly deliveries uh, on that street. And, um, looking at what can what can happen in the future to further enhance it as a public space in addition to serving the uh, the transportation and delivery function. The uh, on Thursday, the twenty seventh, the Council Civic Youth Committee is going to hold a hearing to discuss um, social equity legislation in cannabis, and it's particularly a, a study that's been released that focuses on uh, local approaches at the city, both at the state and local um, levels by uh, an entity called the Initiative Organization. Uh, on June 1st, next week, Tuesday, the um, Economic Development Committee of the City Council is going to hold a hearing on to, to understand the um, small business grants and loan programs that um, our economic development staff have been managing. 
and um, learning from that uh, what needs to, what, what worked and what might want to change, um, particularly given that there are additional federal funds that um, might be coming our way uh, through the uh, most recent stimulus funding, the, um, the ARPA funds. June 2nd, that's next Wednesday, the Council's Neighborhood and Long-Term Planning Committee is going to um, hold a public hearing on the Alewife Plan um, from Envision that was, that was concluded a couple of years ago um, and came under a lot of discussion during the rezoning discussions related to uh, Calvert Captain Forbes' petition uh, earlier in the year. Um, so we will be pivoting to that, and then uh, the Housing Committee will hold a hearing, the Council's Housing Committee will hold a hearing on June 3rd um, to discuss both um, the changes to the inclusionary zoning preferences, uh, which is for eligibility for who um, who applies and who has preference in the tenant selection process or home, home buyer selection process, and um, to also look at the recent adopted housing choice law at the state level and how that might impact Cambridge, including um, any impacts on zoning. So the, that's a long list of things uh, that the board might be interested in that are coming up. Uh, one more item that we just learned about uh, this afternoon is that uh, the governor um, is filing legislation to um, extend the allowance to use um, online platforms for uh, for public meetings through September 1st. Uh, so it's you know it might take some time to understand if it's um, which way it, it whether this will pass or not. But um, either way, the intention is to provide a little bit more cushion um, rather than have the um, ha have that allowance expire with the end of the emergency June 15th. Uh, so. We, in the coming days, we should learn more, and we'll keep the board apprised as we um, as we hear more. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it to you, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, if there are any questions from board members, you can raise your hand. Okay. If not, then we'll move on to the next item, which is approval of the meeting minutes. Uh, the board has received certified transcripts for the meeting held on April 13th, 2021. If there are any questions on that from board members, please say your name. Is there a motion to accept the transcript as the meeting minutes? Uh, Mary, so moved. Louis second. Roll call vote. On that motion, Lou Bashi. Yes. Ted Cohen. Yes. Mary Flynn. Yes. Hugh Russell? Yes. Catherine Preston Connolly? Yes. It's all members voting in favor. Great. Thank you. All right. And then we will move on. As Iram noted, to the next item on the agenda, a report on utility planning uh, from the Cambridge Department of Public Works, the Cambridge Water Department, and the Eversource Gas and Electric Utility. Uh, we'll, the board will hear brief presentations from representatives of each utility, followed by public comment. And after that, the board will have an opportunity to discuss. So we'll start with city staff explaining the background and giving an overview of the process. So please introduce yourself and anyone else on the staff team who will be speaking. Great, thank you. Uh, so Kathy Watkins, city engineer. Um, and I think Iram talked about this being a very exciting topic and I hope we'll find it that way. Um, so, yeah, we're really here to talk about infrastructure planning. So, again, I'm here from the um, Department of Public Works. Also, at the meeting is uh, Commissioner Ona Reardon. Um, from the Water Department, we have both Sam Corda as well as Mark Gallagher. And then we're going to turn it over to the Eversource team, and Liz Toner is really going to take it over from that team, um, and then she can introduce the rest of the um, Eversource team. Also, at the meeting, we have the city electrician, Mark Mello. So, we have a lot of different folks working on infrastructure throughout the city. Um, and, you know, this really is the first time we've done this meeting. So one of the things we'd really like feedback from the board um, as we have discussions is what's unclear, what could we provide more information on, what would be helpful. Um, 
to set this up to be a successful annual check-in. So any feedback folks have about it would be helpful, would be really appreciated. Um, we are also doing a similar um, meeting at the Pullman Conduit, at the July meeting with both Verizon and Comcast. So we wanted to do a sort of similar infrastructure planning around those utilities that felt like it was more appropriate at the Pullman Conduit Commission as opposed to the planning board. So to really try to focus on the things that are most directly connected with the work you all are doing. So I'm really going to focus on um, sewer, drain, streets and sidewalks, and then I'll turn it over to Mark and Sam, who are going to focus on domestic water. So um, a couple months ago, I sort of came and did a sort of abbreviated version of this when folks are sort of asking, you know, what, how do we differentiate between infrastructure work the city is doing versus infrastructure work that we're asking private developers to do. So I really want to focus on the two different plans we have. So we have a 10-year sewer and drain infrastructure plan. If people haven't reviewed it and read it, um, please do so. There's a lot of good details in there. When we're looking at the priorities, and again, this is a 10-year plan, understanding that these projects are significant. They can be 50, 80, $100 million programs. And so these are not sort of things we're turning around in six months period. So, you know, we're planning now for things we're going to be doing three to five years from now. Um, and a lot of the requirements that look, things that we're looking at in terms of developing those priorities, some are regulatory, some are infrastructure, what's the condition of the infrastructure. We focus a lot on water quality, and I'll talk a little bit about this. You know, so much of the core of what we're doing is really public health and environmental work. Um, and then we're also working with private developers to make sure as they're doing additional development in the city that it's really benefiting our overall system. And when I talk about environmental focus, if you think about um, you know, where sewer flows go and pollution of sewer systems, so much of that started with public health and really making sure individuals were, um, were healthy and kept separate from sewage flow. So that's one big core. The other big core of things that we're working on is really water quality. So if you look at the, the work we've done over the last 25 years and that we've done some other communities, the MWA have done, it's really about improving the, the Charles River, the Mystic River, the Boston Harbor. And based on that work, we've seen reduced flows of combined sewer overflows, which I'll talk a little bit about, by 98% in the Charles River and 85% in the um, in the AFY Brook, and that is significant improvements in terms of the water quality of those bodies. And the Charles River, the annual letter grade the EPA gives the Charles River, has increased from a D to a B. So again, we have more work to do, and we're committed to that work, but we've made significant improvements. A lot of that work is coming from regulatory requirements, saying think about how your systems work, think about the storm water that's going into those water bodies, and what are the mechanisms you can do to make sure that that water is cleaner and that those water bodies are cleaner. We talk about combined sewer systems versus separated systems, and this is important in terms of how Cambridge's system works. So the top right image is a combined sewer system. In this image, when it rains and there's water on the street that goes to a catch basin, it goes into a single pipe that also contains the sewage from your house. So if you flush the toilet, it goes into that same pipe. That works really well of the time. So during small storm events or on dry days, all of that water goes to the treatment plant for us, which is Deer Island. In instances where there's extremely heavy um, rainstorms, we have a combined sewer overflow, which sends that combined water to the rivers instead of having it back up into people's houses. So again, portion of the city is combined sewer, and it works really well um, during low flow events or smaller storm events. When we talk about a separated sewer system, then two different pipes. So the, the sewage from your house goes into a sewer pipe that goes directly to your island, and then the stormwater goes into a different pipe that then goes to the river. And again, we're worried about what the, the quality of that water is as it goes to the river. This is a map, and again, this is all, the images are all posted on the website and then are also in the 10-year plan. The blue areas are areas of the city that are separated. So again, they have those two different pipes. The tan areas are the portions of the city that are combined sewer systems, just to give people an overall flow. The other thing that's interesting on this map is this sort of dashed blue line. And that indicates if you get rain and it sort of falls on this side of the street, it's directed toward the Charles River. If it's on this side of the street, it goes to the Elm Brook, which then goes out to the 
River. So we have two different watersheds that we're managing in the city of Cambridge. As we're looking at priorities and saying, you know, how do we pick the, the projects that we're going to focus on, we really look at the existing condition of those pipes. So we have regular condition checking of the existing pipes to understand which ones are most vulnerable. We also look at level of service and flooding. And I know that comes up a lot in the board in terms of alewife, in terms of where there's been a fair amount of development. But I'd also just point out, we have significant flooding that happens in the east of the city and in the port neighborhood. And so as we're looking at prioritizing projects, we're looking at those areas that are vulnerable to flooding and understand what we can do to improve our system. So this is a map of the 10 year plan that really starts to outline where we're doing these larger capital projects. So I mentioned the port, which is an area that is prone to flooding. And that's this sort of yellow blob here. Um, sorry, I have a couple of animations. So that's this yellow area here where we have a significant um, program ongoing to improve the streets, sidewalks, utilities, as well as reduce flooding in that neighborhood. We also have a large capital project on River Street and then a tank over at um, the Tobin um, School that we're doing in conjunction with that project. So we're looking at projects in conjunction with other projects and then also going to prioritize based on all these different criteria. As we prioritize utility projects, we then feed those as well as other priorities into the five-year sidewalk and street construction plan. So this has been in place for over 10 years um, at the department. Each year we sort of build up a little bit. Um, there's a real focus when we're looking at streets and sidewalks to make them really function for all the different users. So thinking about people who are walking, biking, taking transit, and really using the streets in the different ways. And so we try to have as complex and complete a um, approach to the street designs as we can. To the sewer system and drainage system, we go prioritization process for streets and sidewalks, we're really looking at where are people? So where are high priority locations? Where are schools? Where are senior, center, senior buildings? Um, where are major thoroughfares that have bus routes? So you know you have a lot of people accessing, getting on and off the bus, and so accessibility is really critical. We also prioritize streets and really coordinate with the Cambridge Bicycle Plan, as well as priorities identified from the Commission of Persons with Disabilities. Um, we also have um, an assessment of the existing conditions for paving, as well as the condi existing conditions for walks. And again, we sort of consider all those different things and then come up with a plan for where we're going to do construction over the next five years. And again, you can see those areas that we talked about from the 10-year plan, the utility planning, the areas of the port, River Street, and then we're also layering over other different priorities in terms of street and sidewalk reconstruction. So as we're doing the five-year plan, and one of the reasons we really pushed to do the five-year plan, I would say there were sort of two key things. One was accessibility and making sure that as we were doing these projects, we were really focusing on accessibility and making sure um, that the, the sidewalks really work for people. The other thing was to make sure we could say to utility companies, such as Eversource, and when you look at the work they're doing um, on the gas system, so our water department, that they could coordinate their improvements with our work. So if we're redoing a street and sidewalk, we're saying to these folks, is there other work, other utility work that needs to be coordinated? Um, and so it's been a real opportunity to improve the amount of coordination that goes on with the other utility companies. As we're looking at projects, again, we really try to prioritize climate change work, and I think we've talked about that. Um, you guys have been involved with the zoning task force in terms of the updates from that group. And, you know, climate change is really important looking at our streets and sidewalks, both in terms of heat and the flooding that we're seeing. And in terms of heat, one of the most critical things we can do is really look at the tree canopy. Um, and so everything we can do to make sure that we're maintaining existing trees on our sidewalks, as well as planting new trees and providing as much space for those trees as possible is really critical. So the image at the bottom is um, looking at three different streets in Cambridge on a typical 90 degree day, what does that street feel like? So if you're on Fawcett Street that pretty much has no trees, that 90 degree day is going to feel like 8 degrees. If you're on Dudley Street, which has got about a 30% canopy cover, it feels like 90 degrees. If you're on Washington Street with 60% 60, 60 canopy cover, it feels like 88 degrees. So you really see a clear difference in terms of what it's like to experience those streets, walk on those streets, live on those streets depending on that tree canopy. 
this is a map that we really stole from the urban forestry master plan and it's a high locations for planting so really looking at locations where the tree canopy is less than other areas and then also prioritizing again these major corridors where you a lot of people walking biking and taking the bus and so really being experiencing those and again this overlaps with the work the planning board does because there's real opportunities when you look at the quadrangle in particular that is really under treed um and really lacking in canopy there's an opportunity as we're looking at development projects to enhance that canopy um the city i would say has pretty aggressive and is a high level commitment in terms of funding for um, capital improvement programs. So we have over the five year plan and the existing budget, um, there's about $65 million for a street and sidewalk program. And then there's over $230 million that have been allocated for other projects. So some of those are, um, you know, the port improvement projects that we talk about, but also other capital projects like Inman Square and other projects going on through the city. So there is a significant investment in our infrastructure in the city. And then just to sort of close, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, when we're looking at private development projects and they're coming to us, what are we looking for in terms of infrastructure? So, you know, always looking at the budget and stocking for. So how many utility cuts are they doing? How much disruption are those are they doing to those existing streets and sidewalks? and looking for developments to make appropriate improvements. So depending on the scale, if it's a single family house, we're looking for much less investment, um, but always looking at what are those adjacent streets and sidewalks looking at. Um, looking to improve tree canopy, looking at sewer capacity, so the capacity in, um, particularly if it's a large development in the sewer that's right at that location, so not once it gets to the larger collector system, but really at that, um, at the primary location. And then there's a state regulation. I, you, when you see memos from DPW, you may see the term II mitigation. So there is a requirement and it's inflow and infiltration. So it's a four to one requirement for every sewage goes into the system for new larger developments. They have to pull out four gallons of stormwater. And that's where we get into some significant um, investments from developers. So if you think about MIT, Soma development um, because for every gallon of sewer they put in, they had to pull out four gallons of stormwater. They constructed a new stormwater outfall at Talbot Street. So we talk about the Talbot Street outfall that gave all of that area in Cambridge Port that is currently separated away for that water to the river. And so again, they can do significant investments in infrastructure that meets their DEP requirements that also really improves how our system operates. And then stormwater management, again, I think you see that a lot in the memos you get from us in terms of looking at the quantity and quality of the water. Um, and then domestic water, so not stormwater, but domestic water, Mark will talk a little bit about, um, but also looking at the condition of the water mains that are serving the larger developments. And then building designs, we've talked about this a lot, which is really looking at look, using our flood viewer to say, well, what is the projected elevations of flooding? And are you designing the buildings to, to take that into account? So that was the whirlwind tour of uh, infrastructure at DPW. Um, now I'm gonna turn it over to, I'm not sure, Sam I think was double booked, but there was some issue with um, city council tonight, but between Sam and Mark, they're gonna take over and go through the water department. Mark, it's all yours. The mark is uh, Sorry, I forgot to unmute. I started and I hadn't unmuted. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm Mark Gallagher, uh, intern district uh, Cambridge Water. Um, and um, we are a utility, um, you know, city uh, operated utility um, providing water to the city of Cambridge. Um, Cambridge is one of the cities in, um, uh, in the Boston area that has uh, our own independent water supply. Um, as you can see here in the picture, everyone uh, knows Fresh Pond and the treatment facility uh, here in Cambridge. Um, next slide, Kathy, please. Water starts uh, is a long journey up uh, the towns of Lincoln, um, Stanton, Waltham, 
um, where it travels through our Hobbsburg Reservoir into the Stony Brook Reservoir. Um, and from there, it enters the Stony Brook Conduit, which is a pipeline that's approximately miles long, um, starting as two 30 inch water mains. And as it enters water down, it transitions into one sixty three inch um, pipe. Um, and it is Cambridge at uh, Mount Auburn Street near the cemetery, uh, where it goes up Park Ave, crossing Aaron Ave. Provides water to fresh pond. Uh, and it goes to the treatment facility. Um, and once uh, uh, once we we treat it and clean it uh, for all our drinking water, uh, it's then pumped from the from the um, plant fresh up to our tanks in uh, Payson Park in Belmont. Uh, that is pumped up on a 40 inch uh, water main uh, and then by gravity altitude. Uh, next slide, please, Kathy. Next slide. Um, so, uh, recently, we had a lot of questions about uh, with all this development and uh, infrastructure build out in the city of Cambridge and a lot of uh, new high-rise uh, you know, apartments and stadiums. What does that mean for the city of Cambridge water supply? Um, this slide here shows uh, back in the early mid-90s, the uh, water department hired Camp uh, engineering firm to do a study on uh, water demand projection over um, right through to uh, uh, project out to uh, 2040. Uh, their demand projections at the time, um, if you look the top line, the yellow line at the top is our um, withdrawal, um, our red withdrawal limit with the mass DEP of 60 million gallons a day. Um, and the dark blue line shows what actual historic water withdrawals um, have been since uh, 1996. Um, the lines on the right, the lower line, um, was they're projected how much water we would use um, if there were no additional buildup from that time to 2040. Um, and then they also did a prediction for um, what the demand would be with additional build out. Those projections, as you can see, um, were always uh, well below our registered withdrawal limit. Um, however, um, historically, what we have seen is that we have never come close to actually those projections. Uh, next, Kathy. Your historical water usage. Uh, from 1966 to 2020, and as you can see, even though our population has continued to, to grow, and uh, also you know lots of uh, uh, lot of detail infrastructure, a lot of labs, a lot of large buildings have been built. However, our um, demand has continued to drop um, and gone well below any of the um, predicted. Demand you demand. <clears throat> in fact, we've reduced down about 46% since 1970 on usage. Uh, part of that is because you know we continue to um, uh, talk about water conservation. We're always you know putting that out in our newsletters and on our website, you know, promoting water conservation at home. But it's also the industry has responded um, with energy efficient uh, appliances. Like you know, dishwashers, washing machines, shower heads, and things like that, and all that has um, definitely, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of improvement, obviously, in uh, the amount of demand going down instead of up, even though the um, uh, amount of people using it has gone up. Part of that is also um, invested uh, in redoing the um, water distribution system infrastructure. Next slide, Kathy, please. Our distribution 
transmission system. The transmission system in Cambridge is roughly 210 miles of pipe. Stretch that out end to end. You could run a pipe from Cambridge to Manhattan, put it in perspective. Pipes range from 4 to 63. 24 miles of transmission main. It's a large diameter main that supply water to the distribution system. Um, and we have pipes, active pipes, um, that were installed in four. Um, this here, uh, particular picture here, is the main main here now. This picture was taken in 1904 um, when our transmission main uh, picture was taken. Um, is because they were having significant leak issues, even though the pipe was only two years old. It was caused by uh, electric lines, um, uh, creating electrolysis on the pipe and, and creating leaks. That particular section, the section of the pipe, and recently that had to be replaced in the 1950s. Other than that, and, um, most of that transmission is still in, in uh, use today, and it was built in the late. Um, water, water leaks and water breaks are a significant um, uh, can loss of water, but also can cause flooding and damage to city streets and property, uh, things like that. This other, um, picture is a uh, large water main break that we had where we had a critical failure. And critical failure on a pipe, this is a 24-inch main that critically failed, um, can release a large, you know, significant damage to uh, not only our infrastructure, but other utilities and the streets and sidewalks. Um, we have to, you know, then also get out there and shut the water off um, and, you know, shut people's water. Off, they lose water un unexpectedly. You know, uh, this act, actually, this particular picture was Christmas Eve in 2018, and we we're out there repairing that main to try to get it back online so people had more water for Christmas. Slide. Um, this is a station. Again, this is just another example of when our infrastructure fails. It can be, um, you know, quite uh, quite significant. Um, this is the path going underneath uh, Elwife Brook Parkway at the uh, MBTA Elwife Station. Next slide. I think oh, I didn't know you actually had one. So, yeah, as you can see, uh, quite a bit of water can be released, and you know, the potential for um, you know, public safety is high. They were just trying to keep one of those drains that Kathy was talking about open so the water didn't flood, uh, you know, create even more of a flood. <clears throat> Um, you know, react. You know, so most of these leaks, you know, we have we're reactive to, and when you react, when you're reactive instead of proactive, uh, it can be quite uh, quite. Here's a leak we had uh, um, back in 2015. Um, labor, uh, and as you can see, the damage this picture. By the water undermining um, the street, and so the first thing we need to do is go in and then you know uh, do a repair. Uh, first, we got to find the leak, and then we have to do a repair. You can see the holes in the street. You know, public safety again. The damage is, is can be responding in a reactive way to something like this can be quite expensive. We had a higher contractor to come in, um, you know, for 26 hours. They worked there, and it cost uh, over $80,000. And that does not include, you know, the, the cost incurred just by uh, the water department as well. So, uh, in order to try to reduce these uh, these events, these leak events, uh, um, we are 90 to take a proactive approach. Um, again, we hired Camp Dresser McKee um, to do a distribution, um, the transmission and distribution system. And uh, one of the main things of that, that um, except 7% of all the flow we were uh, on. 
on our old six inch online cast iron mains. Um, so they made um, a list of priority mains and replacement approximately um, mile priority mains um, that they said should be replaced. 26 miles of those were the small diameter of the mains. Um, currently, right now, um, since 1992 distribution study, um, we have replaced, uh, there were a total of 26 and a half miles of uh, high priority mains. We've replaced 13, uh, almost 14 miles of that are 52%. Right. Um, when we're doing these um, priority water mains, uh, you know, then we started about 12 years ago. Um, the DPW was making a concerted effort to, um, you know, get a, a, a long-term improvement plan together. Um, and so we have been coordinating with them and trying to um, identify streets that are high priority for us on uh, the DPW so that we work in conjunction rather than, um, you know, uh, opposite each other or, you know, um, doing them 10 years apart and redoing the same street. Just um, so we coordinated this effort, you know, up uh, and then that map shows um, our, the, in the year was the streets priority mains that we still have yet to do. Um, and then the ones in purple are uh, uh, streets that are um, streets on the current PW uh, five year plan. Uh, and the blue are ones that they've already completed from that 1992 priority list. So, as has uh, resulted in, uh, here's a graph showing the uh, yearly number uh, of leaks from 1994, which was right after the distribution study. Um, you know, it took about 10 years of being proactive to finally see a trend uh, in a drop in the, the leaks per up until the last year, 2020 was the, the least amount of leaks on record. So being proactive and putting the money in coordination into doing, replacing all these streets, um, we've had a significant reduction in leaks and therefore, um, you know, uh, the chance for uh, 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 flooding and to, um, uh, uh, greatly reduced. That's the same slide. I think that's it. And that is it. So I will um, stop sharing the screen. This is Kathy. Um, stop sharing the screen and turn it back to the chair. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, before we move on to the next presentation, um, I want to give board members a chance to ask any clarifying questions. And these really should be, you know, focused factual questions that opposed to kind of big questions to engage with more later. But if you have any uh, clarifying questions for DPW, uh, let's Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick question. There's not a cuff answer, but uh, as Aram noted at the outset, uh, I'm sitting in uh, uh, the net city. So I'm interested in the amount of energy that the city spends uh, to move the water. And uh, now, now, thank you. Now I have an understanding of how this all works. And you're pumping it up to Belmont, and then we're feeding by gravity. So it's probably the cost of of, uh, of moving that heavy water. The water flow, you're probably making a huge difference in terms of the of the city infrastructure uh, by the conservation method, meth, methods and uh, and as has been detailed, reducing all the leaks. To report back to our net zero committee, unless you have a, an answer about the energy cost of moving water, um, not only leaks 
on the pressurized system, but in the drain, uh, my understanding is if you've got a leaky drain pipe, you do water um, begin to dry out the groundwater. Uh, you, of course, are expressing it to the river. Concern there, I guess, on the environmentally, that those drain pipes also be um, relatively leak free. They don't explode as dramatically as the water main breaks, but um, there's an issue there in aging infrastructure. And I thought if you could address that, uh, how, we're, how we're doing with that. Those are the my simple questions. Thank you. We started out as our baseline is 9 million kilowatt hours per year. And we put variable frequency drives on our large electric motors and we're down to around 3 million kilowatt hours. So that's been very fruitful by reducing our uh, the usage by 2 million kilowatt hours a year. And we still have some work to do to continue improving that um, usage. Great. So this is Kathy. I can um, so when I talked about flow and infiltration, that's also part of what we're talking about is that infiltration through the pipes. So one of the things that we do and when we're looking at the condition of utilities is to look at um, if there's leaks in those pipes. So we will TV and clean those. So we clean them first and then do a video of them. And you can see if there's significant infiltration. And if there is significant infiltration, but the pipes are otherwise in good condition, then we'll align the pipes so we can do a non, you know, much less invasive um, lining of the pipes to address those issues. Thank you. Mary? Um, thank you, Catherine. Um, so I'm uh, curious as to um, what other sources of funding um, are available for some of the work that you're doing besides um, city funds. And um, are there um, for homeowners that might need, I, I'm assuming when you're talking about license and everything, you're just talking about the main lines in the streets, and then there's some responsibility on the part of the homeowner to get from the street to the house. Um, are there programs in place, in sort of a loan program or grant programs that help assist um, homeowners both to replace or to identify if, if there are issues? So, Kathy, so I can, um, in terms of funding, so we use uh, um, different sources of funding. The, the majority of our funding is city funding. And so, um, for our sewer and utility work, that's really coming from the sewer bills that people pay. Um, and then the street and sidewalks are generally coming from general fund, property tax type of funding from the city. Um, we also get funding from um, MWRA when we were doing associated with sort of the West Cambridge sewer separation and a lot of work that was really tied back to the Boston Harbor case, we got significant funding from the MWRA. The MWRA also has funding available to municipalities for and this, AI, this inflow infiltration because they are very, you know, they want to keep um, stormwater out of their sewer system as well. So the less flow that goes to Deer Island, the better off of us. And we, get, we have gotten, um, MWA II fund using some of that now in the port neighborhood. Um, and then we have also gotten state revolving funds, um, which generally you pay back, but they are, tend to be interest free. So those are typically the sources of funds for us. And in terms of people's um, sewer connections from their house, they, that is the, own, the responsibility of the property owner. We do work with people in terms of trying if you know, you know the location where people have had issues and we're ready to redo a street, try to have them do that work in advance, but that is ultimately the responsibility of the property owner. Great. Thank you. Lou, did you have a question? Yeah, I get a couple. Of key, I believe there's a few ones. Um, I guess the cap. Um, does it get penalized for not being 100% separated on the sewer side? That's a complicated question. So um, we have a number of that's DPPA that, um, in order for us to have connections from 
um, air stormwater system into the Charles River and the Elway Brook. As part of those permits, we have responsibilities in terms of continuing to do the water quality. And so it's certainly our expectation for separation where it makes sense. And then also it's becoming more clear to folks that stormwater is also contaminated. And so it's not just enough to say, okay, we want to separate the sewer system, but how do we do that and also send as clean a stormwater as we can to the river? So separation, we worked with the MWRA to say, send a little bit of the stormwater to the MWRA system, because particularly the first flush of stormwater tends to be the dirtiest when it's running off the streets right out, you know, and it hasn't rained for a while and it's got the oils and the most litter and um, nutrients in it. And so flush the stormwater to the MWA system and then send the remaining uh, uh, Charles River. And so again, more and more, the shorter answer is yes, we have significant commitments to continuing to improve the stormwater and the, the receiving water bodies. Thanks. Um, this may be a little hard to answer off the, off the cuff. Um, what percentage of the outfall that we send to the treatment plants would be still very, very variable uh, amount, but quite a percentage on a, ra a relatively usual rainstorm? You're asking? To Deer Island or Nut Island treatment. You know, I don't know. I mean, we have meters, so I know we have that information because we have meters in all of our connections to the MWA, so you can see what our normal flow is. Pop quiz, though. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, thank you. I, I, it'd be interesting because I read storm. Um, and when you show um, your ongoing project and some other things you're thinking about, in my direction. To, uh, can you just give me a hint on what that project is about? Yeah, so that was an excitingly titled 9AB, which I know. There was something we did that was actually that changed where the stormwater went. And so it involved where the stormwater went, but the work was actually down at, people may remember, a fairly extensive amount of construction handled the water from your neighborhoods differently than it was before. <laughs> clarifying questions we have from board members then we move on to our next presentation uh, and I believe the next presentation will start out with Elizabeth and so please start by introducing yourself and anyone else on your team who will be speaking and then uh, uh, please be as concise as possible with your presentation Thank you for the reminder. I definitely was talking before I was unmuted. So thank you very much for having us, taking time this evening to hear about the ever source is doing in this city. Um, you know, we're gonna cover a lot of things tonight and we will try as concise as possible. But we you know, with with all the activity as I'm sure you've all have seen, um, we're gonna try to cover as much as we can in this short period of time. Um, so the things that we're going to cover, and if we wouldn't mind going to the next slide, I'm not sure if I'm in control. We're going to go to the average source gas, or some of our upcoming gas products, um, and then we're going to talk about a pilot program that we're working on. Um, and we will also go through our electric load growth forecast, our project, and our goals, as well as our energy efficiency electric vehicle program. Um, and then we'll wrap and we will uh, give you guys an opportunity to ask us as many questions as you are necessary. Um, tonight we have with us, um, so myself, my name is Liz Toner, Elizabeth Toner, I go by Liz, um, and I am the Community Relations Specialist. My role in this organization with the City of Cambridge is I really am kind of a overarching person that gets, gets to experience everything, every single project along the way. So it, it's a great role to be in. I get a lot, I get a lot of activity coming my way and I get to kind of pull it together in a nice neat little bow at the end of the day. 
Uh, we also have our first speaker here is going to be Joel D'Agostino. Um, he's our gas operations manager. He will be followed by Nikki Bruno, who is our director on the gas side. Um, after that, we'll have Todd Lanham, uh, or I apologize, we're going to have Dan Ludwig come in and talk about some of our forecasting on the electric side, both transmission, distribution, and then highlight some of the gas uh, load as well. Uh, following that, Todd Lanham is going to come talk about some of our major projects in the city. And um, and then we will kind of make a shift over to our clean energy, which I will speak to. And then following that, we will we will wrap up with our energy efficiency and electric vehicles. Um, his plans will be William Stack and Sean Pelley for electric vehicles. Um, so I appreciate everybody here taking the time to, to listen. And I will pass this over to Joel to kick us off with our Eversource Gas 2021. Thanks, Liz. Uh, thanks for having us here, everyone. I think we have to go back just one slide. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks for having us on some of our uh, projects. Um, we'll kick it off here. As Liz said, I'm Joel Diagosino. I'm one of the operations managers that covers uh, the Somerville, Cambridge area. Just, uh, to start us off here, our priority in the gas industry is uh, safety. So when you see us out there, uh, we always have safety. So that drives most of the work we do. That drives most of the replacements that we do. And uh, one of our largest projects is our GSET program um, that we'll talk about here on the next slide. That is uh, a program through the DPU. Uh, please uh, go through this program replace all of our legal grown infrastructure with new state of the art have the old cast iron and big steel on protected systems and replacing either coat new plastic pipe reduce our uh, lead count damage uh, as we reduce those leaks the uh, unintended release of methane goes down have great reliability and capacity as uh, occasionally we'll uh, take the load into consideration on all these replacements and we'll increase size as needed to uh, account for new capacities coming online. 45 miles and adjusted goal throughout the state of Massachusetts. Uh, then we bump up and that's across the state of Massachusetts. This pipe is all 11 uh, different uh, we look at when we're putting on the replacement program. So these are weighted through the engineering and maintenance department. Uh, we took a look at each uh, of pipe and we weighed things like leaks on the uh, size of the pipe is heavily weighted in there and uh, any portions, as Kathy mentioned, uh, that are coming up for either road relays or any other construction in the area so we can get construction. Uh, mileage is about sure we do drop down a little bit three around three miles. Uh, that's because we're focusing a little bit more on the large diameter cross iron pipes they'll take a little bit longer to install in place. So our focus uh, drops down a little bit. We can work up to around four miles for twenty twenty three and beyond. Um, our focus generally is on the surface diameter cast iron pipe that's four inch and below cast iron. This pipe uh, is very prone to damage when other condition happens around it. This creates situations uh, for water intrusion or main breaks as, as the water department had said. We have also main breaks uh, that that has the release of methane in it. So we want to avoid those as much as possible. Uh, next. So this is a quick overview map of our five year plan. And throughout the city, we plan to replace some of our mains uh, as the years go on. That image isn't great, but you know we're we're happy to buy it in a format so you guys see kind of stuff. Just just a second now, um, you know format presentation, but if you you know what it is to share this with the group after the fact.
And we will kick it over to Nikki, who's going to talk a little bit about our geothermal pilot program. That is a really exciting new development that we just um, we just kind of unrolled. Nikki can give you all the details, but it, it's it's a great it's a great opportunity for us to work in the clean energy sphere within this you know, the new technology available to offset some of uh, some of this um, some of the load requirements on the gas side. Great. Thanks, Liz. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Nikki Bruno, uh, Director of Clean Technologies here at Eversource. And um, those that have been following some of the EPU dockets, uh, we received a case order for our gas service territory uh, in back in October of 2020. And the DPU approved a geothermal network that we proposed within that filing. Um, we're very excited about the opportunity to do this pilot because you know, there's a couple Ending in CPU, AG is jointly working on with the DOER, Mayor um, McDonald, that here, and um, I think it dovetails with a lot of the clean energy in the state, as well as to reach reality in 2030. So, for those uh, high level overview on geothermal, um, I know we don't have a lot of time, um, but basically, simply put, it's a way of using energy from the earth to heat and cool your homes. So when it's for energy and you're getting excess heat, you're pulling on that to heat and you're displaying that the core energy back. So it's um, what it is about this system is really that you take a commodity, the fuel, and the earth energy um, for space and other applications. So our, our pilot has a couple of that, that are obligated to do our DU order um, that we have situated in the past territory, which obviously the city of Cambridge uh, is, is in that, that territory. Um, it has to be a dense urban and mixed use environment. And what, what we and commercial will have to do. We're looking at converting delivered fuels customers. So heat oil, propane, um, things like that. And in our initial filing, um, it was all around delivered fuels conversions because we, we, we believed it was a win-win from a cost perspective for the customer as well as an emissions and environmental value perspective. Um, and what the DPU had asked us to do uh, is to actually convert to natural gas customers as well. So we're looking to do, and um, what I think about the pilot is that the DPU was not obtained. Uh, they just want to see that mix possible. Um, and then another um, piece that we're looking for a mandate really is uh, acquiring some low income customers to participate in this demonstration pilot. We truly feel that's the right thing to do. Um, we want to make sure that any low income or justice communities are to participate in a pilot like this. Um, the DPO low income family bill three scenario in October, but they said, geez, you could probably try to get that in this uh, mixed dense urban use setting. So um, we do have a dedicated website set. Um, it's, uh, I'll call it dynamic. Uh, it's gonna be updated and we're actively um, bidding out services to help us uh, site, design, install, and operate. You think of it, um, this, is, this could be a new business line, a new service that we can fuels that we have now or and um, to do we want to we would rely on the experts to help us we stand this up internally. Um, three year pilot, first year uh, really getting it, uh, designing and installing it, and then the next year where we uh, will have changing and cooling seasons to to draw upon. Um, and so you know I've, I've told folks in other meetings wherever we can um, we want a, a community that is excited to host this, um, and a group of customers that are excited to be a part of, I'll call it a robust feedback loop, because this is opinions always, but this um, is our beginning to end. We're making it better or we'll note where there are some um, challenging points or where there's successes along the way. Um, and then you know, I have talked to the, the Sustainability Office within the City of Cambridge and look to follow up with them. Um, they were excited about hearing about the progress and um, been working with the Zena. Uh, they've been great advocates of the technology 
um, and have a, I'd call it a really successful and unique narrative storytelling. So it's been great to pair with folks at the work. And we finished one of our active government sessions, bring on some consultant teams to um, reach back to some of the cities gastric territory or about some potential sites. Um, and next slide, please. So this is just information. Um, this is a mark anchor anything here, but you know, think about four uh, in terms of size. It's about a three system. So take you know, we we hundred hundred growers heat pumps. Um, that doesn't mean necessarily a hundred individual be a multifamily unit. Um, and it, it could be this center right next door, different. Looking for that diversity to test the shared loop, the shared network, um, and we think there would be some efficiencies, use all connected in. Um, so we do have a website. Like I mentioned there are. And this is the general inbox that Liz has told us that I have. You, know, you all have my email. If there are other questions that you think of that we don't cover tonight, happy to answer those. Um, and I think with that, I'll I'll close and see if there are any questions towards the end. One. I did want to, I know um, this is my second story about the GI pilot that we're excited about, but I like mentioned the working nature of getting at the um, it's a, um, If folks aren't already following or tracking, interested in tracking it, we're in early June standing up a public website. We have a stakeholder process that's on with a bit of model changes we as gas will need to make. Um, to And, and I think we're going to move on to the meat and potatoes, a lot of what, of what you know, was anticipated here, which is um, my friend and colleague, Daniel Ludwig, and he is going to speak to our load growth and uh, here. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel Ludwig. I'm the leader of the building forecasting for the Eversource operating companies. I'll start a little bit with an overview of our forecast approach. The company utilizes an econometric approach to forecasting um, that allows us to calculate how much of the monthly historical change in peak demand is due to heating, cooling, or economic conditions. Um, we make a bunch of adjustments to our forecast. After the fact, those adjustments include company-sponsored energy efficiency programs, behind the meter solar, and electric vehicles. Lastly, we make an adjustment for known large customer projects. Um, and in the Cambridge area, this is, this is generally quite a big adjustment to the forecast. All right, we can move to the next slide. Here, I just want to touch on what we've uh, experienced with COVID-19 last year. Back to going forward, uh, our latest forecast was just a few months ago, um, spring of 2021. We included our latest large number of assumptions, and we included our latest economic projections. Overall, our latest forecast is slightly higher than last year's forecast, and the main driver is an increase in the customer addition of this forecast. Our load forecast, um, the latest one, assumes that COVID-19 restrictions will not negatively, never negatively summer peak load beginning next summer. We do think that um, this upcoming summer 2020 will have a slight reduction due to COVID restrictions due to the combination of remote working and hesitation. Our forecast uh, two or three months ago, um, a lot since then, still do a, a somewhat of a reduction this summer. And I do, I'm very hopeful now that by summer 2022, we will no longer see negative impacts due to COVID. Long-term, there are some potential increases that could fall out from COVID, including robot therapy or problems, and we could see an adoption, a higher rate of electric cars because of this. Right, next slide. Now we'll shift gears and look at the gas peak day forecast. So the gas peak day forecast horizon is a five-year planning horizon, and that is mandated by the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities. Eversource submits a forecast to the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities two years. That forecast is then thoroughly reviewed by the department staff in the attorney's general's office. The forecast 
here is a forecast that was submitted to the DPU. Um, this forecast was filed in July 2020. Right. As you can see from looking at the forecast, we are predicting a steady increase in gas demand over the next, actually it's not really five years, it's really the next three years because two of these years have already happened. Um, so we are predicting through the 2023-2024 um, heating season. Again, this is peak day gas usage. The current drivers of the higher forecast are increased residential heating customer counts and increased commercial customer counts. Right, next slide. So switching gears to the electric business. Um, so here we're looking at Cambridge summer peak demand. This is measuring the hottest hour each summer. Right, so if we start on the left-hand side of the chart, um, those green squares are showing the weather-adjusted actual history. Um, so you can see there was a, a slight dip in 2020. We believe that is primarily due to COVID-19 restrictions. Um, then if you look off to 2021, the dark blue circle, that is our first forecast point for our 2021 forecast. You can see we're essentially getting back to 2019 levels. There is a, a, a we, we did forecast a, a slight hit due to COVID-19. And then beginning in 2022 on, you can see a, quite a big increase in the forecast. That's when we see these large customer projects coming in. The rest of the 10-year forecast, you can see we're slightly higher than last year's forecast, but essentially the same forecast, just a little bit higher. All right, next slide. Here, I just wanted to touch on some of the things that we are monitoring and evaluating. Um, the first being climate change. Um, this is something that we are looking at very closely right now in terms of rising, av rising average temperatures, the frequency of 90 degree days, and the severity of peak day weather conditions. Um, I will just, in terms of summer peak demand, is the severity of peak day conditions. The last items on this list interest in this group and really pay off each other. And as Nikki pointed out uh, a minute ago, um, the, the future role of this is all currently being played out in docket DPU 2080. Um, we are closely monitoring this and as soon as there is a decision made, you know, we will up the methodology at that point. Um, when we do our forecasts, they are thoroughly reviewed by the Department of Public Utilities and what we don't in our forecast is speculate outcomes of regulatory proceedings. An outcome, we will update appropriate at that time. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Atlanta, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Okay, sorry. I had a little audio trouble this morning. So, good evening. Thank you uh, again for listening. Proceeding. My name is Todd Lanham. I am with Project Services, and it's my team that handles all the major transmission projects and the outreach for those projects in Eastern Mass. Next slide, please. So my, my team deals with the transmission project, and it's, it's that electric delivery system in Cambridge that we are working on to enhance. It's the, it's the, strength, the strength and reliability of of the electric delivery system in Cambridge. Adds in redundancy and flexibility, makes the system more resilient, less susceptible to outages. It meets the growing demand for electricity that you have there in Cambridge, and it also enables a cleaner energy. Structure. That, and I guess how it does that is it, a more resilient transmission grid allows delivery of power, remote, clean energy resources. It also provides uh, flexibility in the distribution system that enables more local clean energy resources to be used well. So it's the, the transmission system, the delivery of the energy, bus network, resilient network really does benefit Cambridge extensively. A lot of this information here will be look familiar. I don't think too many folks are unfamiliar with the proposed project currently engineering. Um, it's the proposed underground station there at the garage parcel. It's 
also consist of transmission and distribution lines that will connect this underground substation to remote locations or existing substations in Seoul, Cambridge, and then across the river in Boston. And what that does is this will reinforce the regional grid and it will create a, a resilient network that will support not only Cambridge's needs, but also the clean energy sources that we described. So what you may not what's what's coming up next? Well, we are projects still working on finalizing line routes, trying to come up with one of the line routes as you see there represented in the different colors. Get down just some manual options for those line routes. Continuing to engineer the underground substation. Later this summer have community open houses where we'll be able to have more dialogue about the specifics of the practice as we analyze the engine. All of this working towards a regulatory filing in the fourth quarter of 2021. So most folks know that you know this is a very unique project. We fill out the citizens of Cambridge and create a um, resilient network and, and care for years to come in the future. Next slide. So with that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn it over to Liz. I know that was kind of a run, a quick run through the project. I do think folks are pretty familiar with, with the project. But Liz, let me hand it back to you and then you know we'll certainly be here for any questions if they have any there at the end of the meeting. Thank you, Todd, I appreciate that. So if we wanna go on to the next slide. Um, I wanted to give a basic run, run through of, you know, it's, it's obviously a huge risk for everyone, of course. I don't know um, if anyone has seen our, you know, there's, there's been a lot of space in the Boston area. I know I live on our local news and live right around the corner from Cambridge. So clean energy really is our future at this company. And that is what we're driving toward across the board. And we can. So a couple of different modalities doing that in on a level on a large scale level within this area is um, through our offshore programs. We've got a partnership with Orsted, which is uh, based out of I think it's Copenhagen, but based out of Denmark, and they are a our partner. We're looking at a ton of different renewable resources with them and how to how to tie grid into larger, more sustainable wind energy um, based um, modality. Moving from there, we have one battery storage project. Right now, and the battery storage project allows us to actually conserve energy in those areas that have as and need, need that as uh, moving forward. It's a great opportunity to, to um, a more sustainable grid um, forward. Moving on, as our electrical vehicle program, my colleague uh, Sean will be talking about in just a minute. Um, but this is really where we're going to pivot the presentation. We talked, um, we talked a lot about all the different kind of mainstream modalities that we are in your city today, between the electric work, the gas work, and then the pilot program with geothermal. Those are a lot more consistent. What I really want to talk about, too, is all the energy efficiency programs and all the sustainable, sustainable options that we're also working with the city on um, in tandem as, as we kind of Manage, manage how to move forward in a city that has so much development and so much awesome stuff going on that we want to meet that demand. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Bill Stack, who is our energy efficiency expert, and he will, uh, he'll will he take it over from here. Thank you so much, Liz. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Bill Stack. I'm manager here in our energy efficiency department. Uh, his emphasis is working very closely with the city of Cambridge. Uh, CNI department right now is working uh, with customers engagement and facilitating education, especially the uh, Budo uh, reporting customers. Uh, the Cambridge Building Energy Retrofit Program is a part with the city who's our person in uh, closely with the Environmental and Transportation Planning Division, Cambridge Community Development. And as you can see, we've done a number of projects here. October of 2019, we've done 165 projects, and since October 2019, we've created almost 17.4 million uh, hours of savings and 
almost 878,030 annually as well. Currently, we're active in uh, lab partners in Cambridge to get to net zero lab, zero lab initiative. Uh, our residential and small business teams are working with Mayor in the Cambridge Energy Science Program, uh, building our program through our statewide municipal partnership initiative. We are creating outreach and events promoting residential and small business programs, and we have a special concentration on uh, income eligible residents. We are trying to do targeted outreach, targeted marketing uh, to low income residents to make sure they're aware of these programs and hopefully get them to participate. Uh, the awareness that we want to create is make sure they know that we can basically insulate their home and update their heating systems at no cost to them. So uh, with that vein, we are working closely with CAPIC, a community action partner in Cambridge, and also the Cambridge Fuel Alliance, as people come this fall, start to work on uh, fuel assistance application. We will use that opportunity to reach out to uh, those residents, uh, promoting, again, our, our income eligible program. Uh, with that, let me turn it over to my colleague, uh, Sean Telly, who will discuss uh, our legal, uh, electric vehicle program. Great. Thanks, Bill. Uh, my name is Sean Tully. I work in the commercial new construction services as part of the agency uh, in our tri-state service territory. Um, and uh, over the past three years, I've really been uh, one of the contacts for our electric infrastructure program that we've been implementing in our Massachusetts electric service territory. Uh, it started as a $45 million capital investment. Uh, and then in the past year, we, uh, we have another $10 million uh, capital that we're, we're implementing uh, before our second phase, which just really got small from the grid modernization uh, filing was happening uh, in a few months in July. Uh, so when working on this, on this program, uh, every source is covering 100% of the infrastructure costs. That's uh, line side assets that would needed to be installed, but also the electrical equipment, conduit, uh, pipe, uh, bollards uh, to protect the, protect the, uh, the charging stations. Uh, also, the customer can be, uh, will be enabled to install uh, a charging station of their choice as long as it comes to the program um, that uh, at their property for their, for their uh, visitors, tenants, or um, employees. So this overall covers, depending on the site, 50 to 90 percent of the project cost. Uh, and we had a goal of, uh, in this first phase, with this 55 million of more than 450 sites in our service territory, and enabling up to uh, 4,000 uh, ports. So one of the things that is I really enjoy program and I love is, you know, working with customers, they're trying to figure out exactly how many ports to put in. They, they, their employee, uh, their fleets, their employee um, commuters, they're really growing and starting to think about their car, uh, we want to start small and be able to have room to So we set all of our services to be able to start off with maybe two charging ports and then be able to grow. So we'll, uh, you know, upsize the equipment and future-proof the, the equipment as much as we can. Uh, something else that's great is, uh, you know, we're uh, you know, we had a goal of 10% of the isolated for environmental justice community that we serve, and uh, we're closer to 90% right now for that deployment. So in this first phase, uh, we're targeting public spaces, municipal parking lots, and state facilities, uh, workplaces, multi-unit dwellings where you know, it's not a single family home where they can easily um, easily install a charging station. It's more of a common parking garage, underground parking garage, or multi high rise We're targeting some of those customers, hospitality and entertainment, uh, uh, hotels and things like that, and then, you know, using fast chargers and strategic locations around travel corridors. So you can go to the next slide. Uh, currently in the city of Cambridge, we have um, projects that are that are uh, six of those are our municipal sites of the city that we uh, we work in partnership with the, the community community development department. Um, so uh, a lot of a lot of time, a lot of site meeting park Bronwyn to be able to develop those, some of those projects. Um, five residential, those multifamily uh, locations, two workplaces, location hotel. So we're also engaged with uh, with the, the city now on extending residential opportunities uh, for residents that don't have an uh, don't have a driveway, 
are going to, and are interested in electric vehicles are going to be charged. So we're looking for some of those solutions and the best to tackle that challenge. Uh, and uh, for our next uh, filing. So uh, that's all that I have. So I'll turn it over to you, Liz, and we can wrap this up. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sean. If you want to just go to the next slide, I'm going to kind of run through just a quick summary. Um, so I think that I think that was a ton of information, and I appreciate your patience. You know, we really this is this is this is a dry run for us, but we wanted to convey everything that we've been doing, everything that's going on on both the institutional level, the things that you guys are kind of used to um, on the planning board, kind of with your oversight, but also some of the things that we're doing behind the scenes that you may not know about. Um, and so we really want to put that message out there. Um, so, so a couple of the, the key bullet take um, So the load growth is going to be a hot spot. It's always been a hot spot. Continue to spot for development. So despite, you know, all the wonderful things that we're doing, the energy efficiency team, it's important to also understand that we have to maintain our reliable um, in the best way possible. So, you know, obviously we wanted to highlight all those energy efficiency um, benefits that were, that were to include our game plan in Cambridge, but also we wanted to acknowledge that the load growth is growing and we have to kind of, we also have to forward and maintain the system we have in place in order to meet what what's coming in. Um, so that kind of covers our first three on this one. Um, so we also are always enhancing our system. So we're always maintaining, enhancing, and our distribution systems within the city so that our customers um, get the best power, you know, get the they need it at the best um, So moving, you know, we're, 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 trying, we're trying to do everything we can to that as much liable and efficient system possible. And then just to wrap it all up with the gas projects, I know that, you know, there's a lot of heat. I think one of the takeaways that, that the, and I, coming in, it, it, we have, it's, it's providing reliable service to our customers. We're trying to be safe. So when we are doing work in the city, what we're trying to do is make sure that our system is, 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 the top tier of what can we can offer to, to our customers and their alternatives, the geothermal initiatives itself. So um, that's really the primary takeaway as we all know uh, on the board here and, and Kathy knows and her team knows. So it's, it's about every, every day is a little bit of a challenge, but, but, but his team has been so fantastic working with us you know, across the board on both these small uh, small initiatives as well as the large scale project and uh, continue that really positive relationship not only with with the, the city and the people that we work on the day to day, but also with the board itself as we kind of as we as we wrap up, you know, try to try to figure out solutions moving forward. So I hope that this long winded delay didn't bring you all to sleep. It, it's just a lot of videos turned off. It'll work. But uh but I guess we can turn it over to the Q and A, and and then I really appreciate. Thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. I think that this is a great way to summarize everything. Great test runs the program, and I look forward to doing it again next year. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, as as we did with the city departments, uh, we'll now do trying questions for EverSource before we go to public comment, and then afterwards to board discussion. Lou. Let's start with you with public, uh, with, uh, excuse me, clarifying questions. I had a question on the geo. Uh, individual light systems or a multi uh, with geothermal supply or both? Um, thanks, Lou. I, I might ask just a clarifying question. You, when you say a remote, uh, do you mean something with Existing geothermal, or or something. No, basically we basically a geothermal site with a distribution system. I've never seen it done. That's why I was curious. Uh, but okay. This was most likely pointing towards a, um, an individual case by case geothermal system. 
No, thank you for that. It, and you've only never seen it done because it hasn't been done. Um, this is actually pretty groundbreaking at utility scale. So we're, that's why we're really excited about it. Um, Geothermal is a technology and certainly has been done. You know, as if you were the individual homeowner or business owner, you could install it. But I think the unique opportunity by having utility right on is a lot of folks are deterred because the upfront cost of building the installation of the loop is very expensive. And so with the utility utilizing the CapEx investment and being able to um, install that, you recognize those economies of scale. So um, I, I'm not I've seen it like in Oklahoma, there's a co-op who's in, in successfully installed the shared network geothermal um, system. Uh, and the the idea would be that, um, you know, similar to the distribution, you know, you'd have a main trunk line and you run of those lines that connect into the home or business. Um, but, you know, you're utilizing water, uh, water flow. So it's a little bit different in that respect. But even the piping um, material, the HDPE pipe is, is similar. So, yes, it hasn't really been done at scale. I think we're targeting, um, I call it a cluster, like a neighborhood concept. So, you know, we recognize that customer adoption might vary from home to home or business to business. So you certainly can get over, for lack of a technical term, different homes to connect to the shared loop. You know, you do get some. And, and as I'm learning, it's a bit of an art uh, that the science here. So, you know, you do lose some efficacy as you, as you um, have distance in between, but it doesn't mean that it can't work. So, um, hopefully, that gets to your question. Yeah, I, I've been involved in several uh, individual systems in buildings around the country, but where I'm looking, we have several large landowners in the city who do very large projects. This seems like that would be a perfect um, uh, uh, test bed for a fine geothermal, like you were saying, uh, um, a geothermal basic plant and a distribution center in some of these um, larger projects. No, certainly, if you have an idea, those customers, I would touch with the office, but we welcome because I think the customer acquisition, like anything, is going to be, I personally think, the trickiest. You know, you can design and install something that folks feel about the building personally is, is another story. So um, it goes back to willing community, willing customers. So if you have folks in your things that we could look at, I'd, I'd welcome those suggestions. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Other clarifying questions for Eversource at this time? Well, seeing none, uh, then we will go to public comment. Uh, this is not a, a public hearing, but we are going to take public comment. Any members of the public who wish to speak should now click the button that says raise hand. If you're calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. As of 5 p.m. yesterday, the board had communications on this uh, topic, but any written communications received since that time will be entered into the record. I will now ask to unmute speakers one at a time, and you should begin by saying your address, and staff will confirm that we can hear you. After that, you will have up to three minutes to speak before I ask you to wrap up. Thanks, Catherine. Jeff Roberts. Um, so we have a few hands up at this point. I'll encourage everybody, if you're if you do want to speak, to to raise your hand now. Good number of speakers. Speaker is Suzanne Blier. Uh, you can begin by unmuting. I will allow you to speak, and you can begin by unmuting yourself and your name and address. Uh, thank you so much. This is Suzanne Blier at Five Pillar Place. And um, I were, I'm, first of all, thank you hugely for doing this. I think it's a really important to be addressing this. And I'm closely associated with Civic Coalition. And we did a survey of a citywide group of what are their greatest concerns in the city and infrastructure and ordinance was by far even, even ahead of some of the housing issues. So this is really key. And I feel very rich. Um, for it's, it's really worked well. I, and this is going to sound a little bit kind of just going through from one thing to the other. I do think that, that there's room for improvement, um, I think, for around communication. Um, 
through, among other things, neighborhood groups. But I, you know, hear around the streets of things that are happening and people just don't know, and then loose question, you know, Project A, comma B. And my larger emphasis will be on a holistic approach. Um, on city water, certainly the breaks were uh, have been terrible, and it'd be wonderful to get an ombudsman person just to respond uh, because it's really deeply painful. The issue of lining water pipes and the, the question of carcinogens has come up a number of times. Um, the water availability, particularly going forward, solar, the from gas to electricity, green roofs, et cetera. Um, the issue of where to place generators. Uh, we really need a plan to make it uh, not so opaque. My neighbors have had problems with geothermal, and it certainly is an art, but I think that that's a question. I hope you include broadband, of infrastructure, huge needs for schools, for health, for businesses, trees, uh, yes. And let's also include, uh, for the broader holistic, an area approach that brings Harvard, my institution, MIT, biotech, pharma tech, implement tech to the table to discuss development, housing, infrastructure as a local and area because they're all interconnected and you move one. It's kind of we who are activists it's playing uh, sort of whack-a-mole in one way, and we, it shouldn't be our responsibility. Uh, we take it on, but we really need a holistic pro approach within Cambridge and within the city so that we know that we're really in the best shape going forward and so that we get all of these pieces on the table. So um, I had a few minutes uh, left, uh, and I was up late last night at City Council, but I want to thank you hugely for doing this. Maybe there would be a way with the town and gown approach and others to make sure each of these entities actually puts on the table uh, a plan area-wide for how they're gonna address this with housing, with commercial development and with other things. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Kurt Simha, who will be followed by Dirk Henschel. You'll need to unmute yourself to begin. Uh, Robert Simha. Hi, Robert Simha, 303 Third Street. Uh, I'm um, representing in part this evening uh, the East Cambridge planning team uh, on a couple of issues. I won't repeat some of the things that uh, Suzanne Bier uh, raised, which are all also of concern to us. But let me go to three specific things. One, in East Cambridge, uh, there's been a series of problems with meters uh, and the kinds of uh, meter replacements that Eversource proposed uh, have been problematic because they extend out into the sidewalk. And we hope that you will consider other kinds of meters that are um, more, have a lower profile in the buildings so that we don't have the problems uh, where we have accidents on the sidewalk. So I hope uh, that you'll think about that at a very low level. Secondly, it would be uh, extremely valuable, and I've talked to Todd about this in the past, for this, uh, the various neighborhoods in the city in which you are going to be doing a great deal of work to uh, have some idea of the sequence of events and the routes that you are proposing to use. Um, the disruption at this end of the city has been enormous and it will continue. But if there's some way that people can anticipate uh, the kinds of uh, developments that you're uh, undertaking, uh, it would be extremely valuable. And third, with respect to uh, connect, as you improve the gas distribution system and the homeowners are responsible for uh, making new connections, is there some way in which you can identify the, the, the residential buildings that are currently served by lead pipes uh, and uh, a program that will allow homeowners to be able to replace those uh, without an exorbitant cost. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I was muted. The, the next speaker is Dirk Henschel. And um, I'll make this the last call. If you uh, haven't spoken yet and you still wanted to speak, um, push the raise hand button or star nine on your phone. Just do it once and we'll, we'll see your hand go up. You can go ahead, Dirk Henschel. Hi, this is uh, Dirk Henschel. I'm a resident of uh, 157 Pleasant 
immediately adjacent to the Putnam Street power substation enhancement that uh, took place over the last couple of years. From that experience, for the, uh, the um, uh, uh, talking about the substation and the issues that arose from it was that the city and Eversource in the past have had communication, but maybe not always timely and maybe not always complete enough to actually plan expansion of as the power substation in a manner. And the process seemed very rushed and forced at the time with the threat of brownouts that uh, in part due to COVID then never happened. Um, I'm very glad to see that this exchange is now happening. Um, I have to say, however, that the data that are presented, or were presented, do not, in my mind, really seem to answer questions that one might refer to your perspective. I'm not sure if that really is the goal of this exchange, but I'm partially doubling in to see, well, what are the quantitative assessments, and other than just a curve that goes up or down, I see how that really could help discussions where to put the power substation, where to put new um, uh, lines, uh, lines from Boston to Cambridge under the river um, so that citizens can be informed and can inform their elected officials to advocate for them where and how things can be done. I'm very glad to see that the large new power station uh, is now built subterranean at Kendall Square, I think that's a great advancement. It's the first time I hear about it. Could have probably been publicized differently, or maybe it has, but not effectively enough. It makes me very happy. Uh, thanks, Todd, that uh, you mentioned that. Um, but in and beyond the issue of getting a better quantitative assessment, where in Cambridge is the growth? So where do you put the sewage? Where put, do you put water? Where do you need transportation needs, commuters? parking spaces, et cetera, um, and how does this connect to the surrounding communities? Um, I think, I don't know, maybe the planning board members are all knowing in this. They probably have they've done this for a lot of years and they probably know that. But uh, it seems, from my perspective, listen, listening in, other than some cheerful news that, that I really appreciate, I don't see how one could plan knowingly with these data going forward for 10 or 30 years. Thank you. So, sorry, Thank are, you. Are, we allowed to, are we allowed to respond to the questions as we go just for clarification, or are we going to respond at the end? No, so what we'll do is that uh, we'll now we'll move to board member discussion. Okay. And uh, we'll, uh, as board members discuss, they may have uh, requests for additional information or clarification. Appreciate the update. Sorry about that. Yeah, just, just getting the, the, the rhythm down. Thanks. <laughs> Not at all. All right. So so the, we are moving now from public comment to board discussion. And uh, Lou, we'll start with you. Um, thank you. Well, I still have a signal. I seem to be <laughs> losing my computer uh, connection. Um, I'd like to go back to Todd and um, he um, talked about um, where this uh, new substation in Kendall uh, Square is going to be fed from, and I didn't quite get all the locations. And could he clarify a little more on that? I'm curious. Madam Chair, may would you like oh, yes. to respond? Please go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Perfect. Yeah. So, so Lou, the way that the system is being designed, it's going to the transmission system will interconnect with the Brighton substation in Boston, will interconnect with the Prospect Street station in Somerville, and it will connect also to the Putnam and Kendall Square existing substations in Cambridge. So those four stations, we've got two lines that are going to be going across the river to connect into Brighton, but it's those five transmission lines that will feed into the new substation at Kendall Square. And from there, distribution lines will distribute
distribute that energy as it comes in. Yes, I was more, I was curious where the um, connection was going to make. You said three, and I thought there were five feeders for this substation, so I wanted to know. Quite a bit of work in the street around the neighborhood. Yes, indeed. Um, you are correct. As you get closer to the proposed substation, it's, it's the focal point, so the activity will be greater nearer the station. As you get out, as you're going towards those, uh, not only the outlying substations or the, the ones that we're interconnecting with, but also the where the distribution feeders will be delivering. As you get further away from the station, it, it disperses. But yes, yeah, you are correct. There will be a lot of activity in and around the Kendall Square area while the uh, while the active construction is happening. And um, and to and maybe if I might just to kind of give you a flavor for what my team does. Not only do we talk in broad generalities about what to expect and what the projects are going to be bringing to the area as we move into the construction phase. It's my team that actually goes out and, and does um, very targeted outreach to let neighbors know exactly what's going to be happening in front of their houses as it happens. So it's, we start off with a very broad topic, broad uh, swaths, if you will, of when activity is supposed to happen. And then as the construction progresses, we actually do have a team that goes out and does field level outreach to make sure that folks that are, are experienced, that as folks experience construction, they know in advance what to expect, they know when it's going to happen, and we work with them to make sure that they're not unduly impacted. So it's a very hands-on approach as we get into the construction phase. Thank you. Okay. So, um, board members, I think uh, Kathy Watkins noted at the top of this meeting, you know, uh, we, our, our discussion here can be focused not only on the information we receive, but also what would be useful to us for the future, since this is the first time we're doing this. Um, and uh, and um, there's no particular action we have to take on this, um, but any uh, feedback we can give to the staff of any of the utilities on what would be helpful uh, in framing these reports, in uh, communicating with us and with uh, the city uh, is kind of the feedback we're looking for. So, um, Hugh, you, we've got your hand up first there. Let's, let's go with you. Okay. Um, one of the things that was disconcerting was the graphs that showed that gas demand was increasing in the city. And it's my understanding the city's climate change program wishes that we're going the other direction. And uh, there's some goals for uh, having no gas in the city sometime in this century. Um, you know, I'm happy that my house is connected for natural gas. It's convenient and clean, sort of, except the CO2 that's used. Um, not out of my chimney, but anyway, <clears throat> that's one. Um, I had sort of, I would, had sort of expected to um, Councillors on your hand, but maybe there's a conflicting city council meeting. Yes, yeah, he's very interested in this. <laughs> um, the other is uh, district energy systems. Uh, we, from time to time, ask people to explore district energy systems. Um, and there are two, at least. Two district energy systems in operation, uh, Harvard and uh, Harvard and MIT. Uh, I think those involve both generation, purchase power, chilled water. To both, a, I'm wondering if they should become part of this conversation, uh, if only to just see where. What proportion we're talking about, uh, you know, 
in the overall city affairs, but also because of the city's desire to have district energy systems. And I'm very interested in the geothermal uh, experiment because um, that would be naturally, could be naturally a part of a district energy system. I would think also that the city might be um, wise to allow uh, the geothermal wells to be a dug on city property. Um, I'm sure every source will say the, the, street, the streets are already dangerously full of stuff, making their job very difficult. But, um, and I'm sure people don't want to have people dig up trees to, to dig wells, but, you know, there's a big, big green space in Senate Park, for example. And is it possible to go in, disturb the park, build some wells, build maybe an under, underground room that, uh, you know, becomes a connection point. So I think how we include those things in this conversation, I don't know. Um, I must say I find, find all the technical reports both fascinating, insufficient in detail, and loaded with too much detail. It's a very, very complicated uh, system, and we have some, apparently, some very thoughtful people in the public and the private sector who are trying to make sure we can go. Someone suggested, uh, I guess it was a Suzanne, that broadband uh, service was a very important utility, and I think that needs to be included in this uh, discussion. I guess Thanks, Hugh. And um, I, I think, Kathy, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, wrong but um, uh, this was mentioned at the beginning of tonight's meeting, but a broadband as provided by Comcast, as well as service provided by Verizon for all kinds of uh, communication are going to be covered in a similar public hearing and discussion uh, before polling conduit in July. Yes, in July, at the July meeting. So they are going through a similar process with the public and, and reporting, um, but it, just not in this venue. So just wanted to make sure we have that out there for folks. Thanks Mary. For that yeah. Um, thanks, uh, Catherine. Um, so thank you to everybody uh, who has presented tonight, and you, you've given us lots of information um, to think about. And as, as you said, some of it is uh, not detailed enough, and some is, is too detailed for us to comprehend um, just tonight. But I think that the thing that's missing for me is that it is the connections between all of you and how the planning process works among you as a group um you know like who provides who data i mean i guess i think i understand it a little bit better from the city side but you know then how does that resource feed into it yes you've got you know econometric models and all of that but like how much real life data um do you get every year and you know are you aware of all of the projects that are before the planning board and do you know what streets are being done? You know, I, I'd really just like to understand, you know, like as the city does planning, um, how does Eversource respond or how do some of the new initiatives that Eversource is proposing fit into, you know, what the city is planning? I don't think you can tell us that tonight because it sounds to me like it's all done a little bit more piecemeal. Um, you know, you have contacts in different uh, city departments that you work with and uh, to advance the specific program areas that everybody has. Um, 
But I think that that's something that we need to think about as we move forward with this group. Um, that I think the interconnectedness really has to um, be strengthened and become more routine um, so that um, the information that we get back really means something to us. You know, like, and one of the um, comments um, that was made, I think it was by Todd, when you were talking about the, um, the substation, you were saying, you know, it should serve the needs of the city for a long time to come. Well, it may, but we don't know, we don't know what you're actually saying, thinking of it as the needs, and does that sort of fit in with the models that the city is projecting in terms of you know, development and where it's going to occur and all that sort of thing. So anyway, it's, it's for continued thought over the next, next 12 months as we continue to build this process. But thank you all very much. It was a great start. And Mary, maybe this is Kathy. Maybe I can just respond briefly. So, you know, one of the things that came up during this process was there are a lot of discussions that go on between the city and Eversource. Um, both, you know, with Suzanne's group at community development on the sustainability side, then also at public works on our side and, you know, working through the five-year plan, as well as more detailed discussions with Eversource, sort of on a project-by-project -project basis. But, you know, one of the things we committed to doing was trying to get this larger city group together with the larger Eversource group, you know, at least twice a year to sort of have that fuller discussion. And so that is also something that we're following up on in terms of Again, it's going to be a continuous improvement program, but right. um, it was definitely one of the things that came up was a need for that sort of higher level discussion, you know, twice a year at least. Terrific. All right. Thank you. I appreciate the clarification, Kathy. And just from the Eversource perspective, um, you know, it is a challenge. It's a challenge. It has their priorities, and they have things that they have to get done every day, uh, and then they also have their focus on the large scale. So, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk too much on this, but you know, we work. Kathy and I work close together to try to figure out the best way to do this, to try to have a unified message. And that is that is really the goal. And that's why we were really excited to be invited to this opportunity tonight yeah. is because moving forward, that's just what we want to put, put out there when we have meetings with the planning board. When we're talking about one thing, it shouldn't exist in a vacuum. It's not right. going to happen overnight. But this is a great first step. So I appreciate this group in hosting us to kind of help us work through this. And, and on a more communicative basis, because at the end of the day, communication is going to be key, whether it's internally to, it, within our, and, you know, we're always working together internally in some facet or another. We're always working with the DPW very collectively, but, you know, just so you, so there's a more basic understanding from the, the policymaker side and the, and the people that, that, that on a day-to-day basis are working with our constituents to make sure that we're doing the right thing. You know, this is a great start. And that is yeah, definitely okay. a shared goal. <laughs> Terrific. Yeah. It is a really good start. It, may, I add, may I add one thing? Um, just okay. to follow up, um, Mary, the, the, it, was kind of, it was very appropriate that the DPW went before. So let me introduce myself. I'm the director of construction, former manager of Somerville, and I. And thanks for having us. But I, I want to say that you, know, you asked a question about how, what do we receive from information from the city mm -hmm. in regards to construction? And, and I'll have to say that the five-year plan that, um, that Kathy brought up was really a trailblazer amongst all the neighboring communities, something that uh, Eversource operations are privileged to is to work in multiple communities. Yes. And um, we, we were privileged to work in multiple communities. And that, going back to 2011-12 when Owen and, and Kathy were running the show there, uh, it really was instrumental. And it was a, a city that we recognized that stuck to the plan. And obviously, there's going to be deviations in one-off, mm -hmm. but it was something that, um, that, that makes it very easy from an Eversource gas perspective to work with um, because of the constant communication between the two, between the two organizations, uh, city and utility. And um, we, we absolutely look at, you know, risk, environmental, as well as city work as our top three priorities and how we plan our work. And, um, you know, credit to the group, but the Department of Public Works, uh, really head and shoulders uh, over, you know, a lot of other communities that we work with and the professionalism organization and uh, sticking to the plan. It allows us to do our plan and keep our word for our projects. Great. Thank you for adding that. And I, I agree with you completely that we have an outstanding DPW. So <laughs> I'm, I'm not surprised. Thank you, though. All right. Tom. 
thank you, Madam Chair. Just because the hour is getting late, um, um, I appreciated the description of this uh, exciting initiative to go to district energy on geothermal. I think that's the future, uh, as are electric cars. Uh, I worry that the grant application has made the criteria a little too stiff, that we're looking for people who are burning fuel oil, and we've got mixed use and affordable housing all in one district. Um, you know, I was uh, imagining my street. Could we could, could we get these in my street? Because I really do think um, that's what's probably going to happen, is uh, uh, despite the uh, uh, crowded infrastructure below uh, the roadways, uh, geothermal wells probably will begin to occupy that public space because we have to, right? But really exciting initiative, anxious to see how that experiment plays out. Uh, secondly, we're the planning board. Um, a lot of this information is interesting to see how everything plugs in, but we're also concerned about the physical environment and what you see. Um, we routinely are reviewing, for instance, the visual impact of telephone. Uh, uh, relay uh, switches and stations on the faces of building. Visually, I've always argued they're tiny uh, in their impact in the built environment by comparison to the electrical wires and telephone poles that are everywhere in the city. Um, you know, as we are upgrading our infrastructure, that would be something that would make a huge difference in the physical environment of this city uh, if we could find more streets in places where, as we upgrade our streets, that uh, those utility wires could be put on the ground. Uh, also, uh, would make us more resilient uh, uh, during uh, the increasing uh, tropical storms that we're going to experience. Uh, number three, I don't know how I decarbonize gas, given that it's a, a carbon-based fuel. Um, that sounds a little bit like like a sales pitch to me, uh, decarbonizing gas is uh, I, you know, uh, turning it into an electrical fuel source in some way, I guess. I, I don't know. Um, I don't need the details now, but uh, that was intriguing. It doesn't, it doesn't feel right to me. Uh, for um, feedback, uh, what kind of feedback, Kathy asked at the top, what, what can we use as the planning board? The tree canopy focus is obviously a focus of this board. I'd love to know um, our partnerships uh, with the u universities. Obviously, that typifies the city over others. Um, what are we doing working in concert with those guys? You mentioned the uh, outflow that went through uh, MIT's property, but um, uh, that would be a great uh, kind of discussion or a thing to add next year. I know it's blurring down, down. Broadband, I guess, does not get handled here, but that, I believe, is a utility. Um, so I agree. Great people replacing our stuff. I'd like you to do it faster. I love the stories around water systems. And finally, um, as a planning board member, I want to know what the pinch points are in utilities. What's, what might limit our growth if we don't anticipate it properly? Um, where are we approaching our limits? Um, tonight, I didn't really hear where we might be approaching our limits. Always a good story, um, but uh, where we're definitely approaching our limit is um, uh, the race to carbon uh, zero and net zero. Uh, we've got a world that's burning up, and so um, we've got to do that really, really fast. I say a little bit of feedback finally from the front lines uh, to the utility. Um, uh, I hear over and over, I'm an architect and involved with development over and over and again, how difficult it is and how long the application process is to get service uh, to new buildings. Uh, applications for service to new buildings are made before you even start uh, digging your foundations. Yes, you put in a load letter, uh, but everybody's trying to game you guys so that you could get logged in when the tenants arrive. And so it's, it's a mess. Uh, and you guys have got to put the brilliant brains that you got here tonight into that end of your business and start to serve uh, the customers. That is a pinch point. Um, and that is one pinch point I've experienced personally. Uh, and I hope you guys hear that in other forums, but uh, it's, it's, it's not good. So uh, please, please address that. So that's, those are my comments. Thank you, Tom. I can just address that quickly. Just with the pinch points, I would love to talk to you about them more often. We don't have the representatives here that would necessarily be able to speak to it tonight, but I think that that's an important concern, something that we have heard before. So I know my email address is, has been shared, and so I'm happy to take this offline and have that conversation with you. I think that I'd like to hear kind of what what, what you're hearing, you know, from the community as well. So just, just a quick response on that item, because um, I thought it might come up. Great. Thank you. All right, Ted. Uh, yeah, um, well, I appreciate the, the 
the reports and it was very interesting. Uh, but um, for the future, um, please remember that not all of us are engineers and that there's a lot of jargon and a lot of acronyms in your reports uh, that um, certain ones of us simply don't understand and that if the language can be simplified a little bit and, uh, you know, brought down to the layperson, that would be very helpful. Um, uh, I, I understand that uh, broadband and Comcast and Verizon are going to be uh, uh, at, at another meeting, but I think they do impact on planning decisions we make. Uh, if nothing else, we're constantly being asked to comment upon placement of cell towers uh, to recommend things to the BCA. Um, and so I think uh, it would make sense for them to be participating in this reports to the planning board. Uh, finally, uh, from a planning point of view, following up on some things that Tom just said, uh, very frequently when we are doing design review of large buildings, um, we are told that the developers where the vaults or other electric equipment are going to have to be located, uh, that they can't get information from ever source very quickly or very clearly. Uh, uh, when we ask, you know, can they go back and talk about things? I said, well, we'll try. So I'm wondering if there couldn't be some more uh, 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 liaison, let's say, uh, between Eversource and all the utilities, and I'm going to pick one, um, with developers and maybe with that can help understand what the design issues are and that uh, the board prefers a different location that we could have clearer understanding of of whether it's possible and if not, why it's not possible, and maybe some, uh, given the, the developers and the planning board, some alternatives so that we can pick the one that makes the most sense design-wise and for the community. Um, that's all I have to say right now. I, I appreciate the learning about all these things. Great. Thanks, Ted. Did you have any other comments in general you wanted to make? You're good? Okay. I'm good. Thank you very much for having us. We can't wait to improve upon this format. We need to work all, like all my contact information. I do have a benefit an overarching view of all these different things that are going on. So feel free to address me at any time. If I can't solve the problem, I can find the right person. And that might be the case. This is only my my... This is my second year here at Eversource, so when I hear, put in layman's terms, I know exactly what you're talking about. I got Utility 101 last year. So thank you very, very much for having all of us here. Thank you to my colleagues for being here. Thank you to Kathy for, for making it and, and, and her whole team for, for pulling this. Uh, something that I yes, I just wanted to uh, chime in in agreement with one of Tom's many comments. This particular comment um, was done about um, uh, figuring out what the pinch points in the utility system are. Um, we don't do, you know, we're, we've got a huge list of things that we're supposed to be addressing out of a vision for it might affect density of housing, the density of commercial development, the location. Uh, I assume eventually we might get to some of that. And knowing what the constraints on the utility system are um, would be very important in that. Um, I believe the utility mentality seems to be um, we want to be able to deliver our utility, or in the case of the sewer system, take it away. Uh, and we don't want you, you to think of us as what's happening. 
uh, and uh, you know that's a kind of the ability way. You know, we're there to be there when people need our services. Um, but if we're trying to plan, the more we can, and I can understand it may be a touchy point for you to say, well, you know, that like Phil House can go on Howard Street because then, you know, we've got to spend a lot of money to, I don't know, enlarge the sewer, enlarge the water, enlarge the electric. Whatever. Um, so there is a connection. There's, there's a vacancy between this discussion. Thanks. Um, I, Lou, I'm going to get back to you in just a second, but I think Iran wanted to speak to that first. So let, let me go to her first. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, so just to Hugh's point, I think um, this has been a, a really interesting uh, tension, if you will, in our um, from in our work with uh, with EverSource over the years, because we um, when we plan, we're looking in a often a 20-year horizon, and when we create a build out, we don't really know what year things will develop in if we're looking at the whole city or looking at parts of the city, let's like East Cambridge, Western Cambridge, um, we can say, here's what we anticipate in the next 20 years or 10 years. We can next year, and then here's the next thing that will happen in the following year until we have special permits that are in place. So when we share information that is at the macro source, they don't actually know what to do with it. And we've tried this in the past, and we have thought from our side that we've done the job of conveying the information. But to them, it's all just, um, you know, just noise because they can fall in this broad range. They expect this, but they don't really plan in a 20-year horizon. They plan in a, uh, I don't want to speak for them, a three- to five-year horizon uh, when they know much is coming their way because they also have a fiduciary requirement responsibility to their uh, to the organization and so they can't just speculatively go out and build something and and they certainly never want to as, as you said the utility way I think it's not in the DNA of the organizations to say this is the capacity um, so it's a it's it's a little bit of the the challenge for us all to to work through but we're hoping that this format will allow us to both share that information and to be not in the time frames we might really want to uh, be aware of the pinch points. But I think if we start to get into the get into the end, then we might understand a little bit better thinking to points, and they might get a little bit at understanding the terms of our, our development. And Form, we uh, feel really optimistic that it will actually help us be able to use language a little bit better um, and, and will help in solving some of those challenges. Thanks, Aram. Lou? Yes, I actually just wanted to reinforce a couple of things that were said. Um, you know, I I constantly search for transformers and switch gear on our site plans. A lot of times our buildings are already completely drawn and um, we're doing design review and we still don't know where the electrical service is going to be and what it's going to be required. Um, it's kind of disheartening to go through all of this and then end up with a transformer in front of a doorway or on a sidewalk in a horrible spot. Um, this can be avoided. Um, we really need to work on that. And we also, to one of Tom's points, we really need to work on burying our utilities. Um, we need to get them off of the poles. We need to get the poles down and in the ground, uh, the resiliency part of it. And it just adds a whole attention to our city streets. 
flu. So I don't have a whole lot to add that colleagues have said. I, I do, especially on the echo uh, test point uh, and uh, that Lou just mentioned about the design. And I think for next year's report, um, the special from you understand the process that developers go through with you all um, and when that occurs and when those decisions get made. Um, unlike some of my colleagues who are uh, intimately involved in the development process of other buildings and other, uh, which, um, I don't I don't see that that much, and I don't know exactly what's reasonable for them or when where those those points are that we could make improvements. So just more information on what that process looks like, how you interface with developers. Um, you know, DPW has started in the past few years sending us memos with um, information about well, the conversations they've had with developers uh, before they get to us, which is great. Um, but more more information about that process and what goes on and when those decisions are made would be really helpful. All right. Any any last comments from board members? Right, then do I have a motion to uh, uh, close this discussion? A move. Here, so move. Okay, I got Hugh, so move. So Lou, second. Can we get a roll call vote on that? On that motion, Lou Bocci? We just got you on the His internet may have come up. All right, I will say absent for the time being. Ted I'm Cohen. Oh, oh okay. Lubachi. <laughs> yes, okay. Ted Cohen. Yes. Mary Flynn. Yes. Hugh Russell? Yes. Tom Sitch? Yes. Catherine Preston Connolly? Yes. It's all members voting in favor. All right. Uh, thank you very much to all of our utility guests uh, for the uh, reports and, and for all the staff uh, from CDD who also came. Thank you. 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 We have a request for an extension of time for the hearing and decision on planning board case PB358, permit application development for the street. We'll get a, a from staff on uh, the procedural. Good evening, board members. This is Swati Joseph um, on behalf of CDD. So, Uh, the project is a new hotel building on Share Street. The board and it was continued further due to the pandemic. Back to the board with revisions on March 2nd of this year, and the board had additional comments. Um, staff has been you know, continuously meeting with the applicant to discuss the board's comments team on those responses. We have received, received time for decision to September 1st of 2021. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, are there any questions for staff or for the applicants? Or discussion from board members? All right, then is there a motion to agree to the extension of time? So moved, Mary. Tom seconded. Yeah, Mary moved, Tom seconded. Roll call vote. On that motion, Lou Bocci. Yes. Ted Cohen. Yes. Mary Flynn. Yes. Davidich. Connolly. Yes. It's all my favorite. 
Right. Do that concludes the business on our agenda. Are there any additional comments from staff? I'll just do the, the staff. I'll just do the quick PSA that uh, there is no planning board meeting next week. Wait a week off. Um, or June eighth, and as Zero noted, uh, the public hearing that had been scheduled and advertised for June eighth on the um, Article twenty two emissions accounting zoning petition, um, we were advised that petition be filed. So uh, it 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 will so it's already been advertised and we'll acknowledge at the meeting that that's the case, but we won't have discussion of that on June 8th. That will be postponed to a Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, then the meeting is adjourned. Hi, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.